panel. I promise you. Okay. So um, I hear that we're live and um, want to welcome everybody. Hi, I'm Ann Gray. <laughs> and hi out you out there to our audience. I'm Ann Gray and I have actually edited my own fanzines, mainly a, um, a con running zine because that's my main smopping activity um, called Mid Fanzine that's available on eFanzines. And um, I've also written a number of articles for Journey Planet because James is very hard to turn down. And um, <laughs> at least for, you know, that kind of request. And, um, and I, I know everybody here is fabulous. So I'm just going to say, you know, you have come to the Journey Planet um, workshop on the next issue of Journey Planet. And I'm going to ask um, one of our co-editors to explain more about what this edition is about. Who wants to go first? First, uh, if it's oh. cool with you, I just get everyone to introduce themselves. So oh, right, right. Uh, everybody first, first to Aaron, and Aaron. then and Chris is going. Chris has joined us all the way from San Jose, uh, some hotel in Western America, I believe. Yay. His house is currently under threat from fire, and uh, um, it's got a particular three-letter code word for the fire because he is living in Boulder Creek. So uh, we'll join you in a second, Chris, but we're just going to get Aaron and then, oh, Eric to introduce themselves. Go ahead, Aaron. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Underwood. I have um, edited with Eric, actually, one edition of Journey Planet in the past that was um, part of the one of the years where Journey Planet was nominated for Hugo. I'm also an editor and a writer and a technology conference planner and um, just a big dorky fan most of the time. So um, that's me. Cool. Eric, if you introduce yourself there to uh, everyone. Hi there. I'm Eric Nunley. I'm an author and graphic designer. And as Aaron mentioned, I, I did work on one previous issue of Journey Planet. And um, I have three novels to my name so far, Love for the Sun, um, All the Dead Men, and Lightning Wears the Red Cape. I've also been um, involved in BossCon as a panelist for a, a number of years now, long enough to, that I can't remember. <laughs> Which is where we met. And then Chris, are you able to introduce yourself and tell us your, how you're doing there? Yeah, I'm Chris. Hi, your editor guest of honor. Um, I am a... I always describe myself as a historian, curator, writer, filmmaker, film programmer, and fanzine editor. And uh, along with James, we've won two Hugos, uh, one for The Drink Tank, one for Journey Planet. Uh, and yeah, I'm currently in a elevator waiting area of a hotel in San Jose. So I'm waiting on confirmation if we're going to see a press conference. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm... So I won't be around the whole time, but I'll be here for at least a little bit. But I can't remember that. She'll come and take you away. Okay. So uh, the Eric got very excited. I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Eric, about Watchmen. And uh, I have to admit, this is a TV series we're talking about. I'd, I'd say we're all fans of the comic by Alan Moore, which is a phenomenal piece of work. Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons, and John Higgins. Uh, but the TV series. And I hope we're not going to try and we're not going to spoil it for you, but it's phenomenal. And then that drifted somewhere else. And then Eric had an idea. And this is how Journey Planet happens. So we're a fanzine that goes out onto the internet by PDF. We bring together a group of people, myself and Chris are, are, the, are consistently the co-editors. People put ideas to us and we say, oh my God, this is full of imagination. It, it, it's, it's going to capture something at the moment. Or gosh, I just want to hear other people speak about this. And we get the chance to sort of bring lots of people together, put it out in a fanzine, which we put onto a PDF. But Eric, talk about the idea, if you don't mind, about this issue, um, how it came to you, and what your and what where your idea went to, and how it's progressed. Maybe. Um, well, my initial idea, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of RoboCop, and and but I recognize that that RoboCop is um, actually, in actuality, an incredibly awful idea. Like that. any any kind of a sort of a super cop type authority person that can just, you know, crush your rights and murder and create mayhem at, at, at will. Make it entertaining on automated screen. Automated rules, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's entertaining on screen, um, but eh, 
and not so much in practice. And then I, I started to think about uh, how, how often the police or some form of policing is uh, uh, represented in media. And, and that led to, well, um, when you look at the cumulative effect of that, what, what is the message that we're getting about that? And it just so happened we had a pandemic uh, kind of racist meltdown with all the protests against police brutality. And I, and I think it just, you know, the idea kind of hit a sweet spot in people's minds when most people are thinking about this um, and what it means, um, you know, it, 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 even in terms of uh, identity, like who, who gets to be the police, who do they work for, what exactly is their goal in all these different uh, science fiction properties, comics, movies, TV. And I think um, as uh, we started to get uh, more and more written pieces come in, we're, we're starting to see a, a, a really interesting broad analysis of what that means. Everything from simply being a fan, which, you know, we certainly want that, to um, to really taking a hard look at how media affects our thinking in terms of policing. And also, um, we're hoping to get more pieces about where people think this might go in the future. Like how, if this isn't working, what what might work, you know, and and, and like that. And it's, and people really picked it up and started to run with it. I'm really glad to see all the enthusiasm for the idea. Absolutely. So what is the deadline for submissions? The 12th of September is the deadline. Uh, but we'll, we'll share some uh, we'll share some work or some uh, work words uh, type stuff. Verbiage? Some yeah, written that, stuff. <laughs> I have no idea. Ooh, into the chat so everyone can see that. And brilliantly, mm -hmm. uh, the team here uh, from Nasvik are going to transfer that over to Discord so everyone can get a more detailed look and if anybody's here who wants to contribute that'd be absolutely brilliant because that's what it's about it's about hearing other voices and, and hearing new voices and it might be that you go oh, i don't really have anything to say on this subject but my friend has been talking about this for ages and maybe right. they'd like to contribute and it depends so we try to reach out to different corners of fandom and beyond um and and, and to reach people but it's a tricky subject and we sort of try to set out Erin, how we want to deal with this, don't we? And I'll, I'll, you tell, if you can explain to people how we, we've gone about framing this as well. Yeah, so um, I guess just to start, I would like to, to mention like one of the things that draws me to science fiction is because it's a wonderful way to, it's a lens into examining and exploring ourselves. And one of the cool things that happens is that the things, the ideas, the principles, the, the technology that you see in science fiction has this incredible way of shaping the, our reality. Like it, it bleeds out from, from the, the pages into our real world. It almost helps to predict or set the framework for our future. And one of the things that's really been bothering me over, over the last several years is you know, you see all these fantastic movies or books and there, you know, there are bad guys and there are good guys and there are cops and there are investigators and there are detectives. And, you know, they often all operate outside of the rule book and people are constantly getting hurt. Criminals are constantly getting hurt. Um, and yet some of them are criminals. Um, some of them are innocent, some of them are just bystanders. And what's happening is you see these people just as collateral damage in, you know, of the pursuit. And once that scene is done, like all you see is that, that moment of impact, and then you don't see any of the collateral damage but you get this amazing adrenaline rush while you're experiencing that story. Um, and I, I really have had this uncomfortable feeling that that has in many ways shaped our current way of, of, of doing things in the real world. And if we ever have any kind of hope of resetting each everybody's brains on what those real expectations are when you're when you're operating in a in a pursuit or in a police environment you don't get to just shoot everybody you don't get to just hurt people you think are part of the the crime or 
you know, might be the suspects. You don't get to do that. It's not right. And you don't get to hurt innocent people. You don't get to blow up their building and go, eh, we were after the criminal and we got the criminal. And wasn't that an amazing, you know, CGI scene? Wasn't that incredible? Um, we have to be better and we can use science fiction as a, as a tool for examining that. And that's what, when I heard about this idea, um, I just thought that's something I really want to be a part of because it's something I really believe in. And so we are definitely looking for pieces that explore all angles, you know, whether it's a show that you enjoyed, whether it's something that um, really resonates, whether it's something good that resonates or something bad that resonates, whether there's some bit of hope you want to capture in a moment or whether, you know, you just freaking love Watchmen and you want to write something about that. Um, we want to celebrate all of these things and include all of the voices, even people who are into the science, because that's one of the things I love. If you're into the science of policing and how, how clues are captured, how, how things are tracked, that's part of science fictional policing as well. And that definitely feeds into the real world and scientific developments that are coming out probably today and over the next five to 10 years. And, and Sorry, then, I talked a lot. <laughs> no, we didn't, you were brilliant. Uh, and that's, and that's, that's, that's great. Uh, it's better that it keeps me and Chris not talking, which is really important. And, <laughs> and, and Chris, <laughs> but what do you have to add now from your perspective there with this issue, uh, talking about how it came together um, and we'll talk then about what we're going to try and ask people to write or do. Um, we've already put something into the chat. Hopefully that will be shared. So Chris, what's your perspective on this? So my story perspective, I have sort of three. Like on the big picture, I am the pallid cousin of a bunch of brown kids. Um, I'm the oldest in my generation and the Garcia side of my family uh, is has had their issues with the law, of course. Um, it's both positive. Uh, we have several cops in the family and almost all of one side of my family, 28 kids, uh, three wives, one dad. Uh, all of them have worked for the city of San Jose over the years. And one of the things that I'm actually working on, I realize I should do this today. The only Hispanic police chief of a major metropolitan area is here in San Jose. And it's a guy I went to high school with named Mike Garcia. Um, so I'm going to see if I can get a nice interview with him. Uh, uh, all this aside. <laughs> um, but one of the really interesting things I find in uh, just the area of how policing is done in science fiction is this idea that the police are a monolithic force. And the idea that once the uh, police are involved, they are working as a single unit. And usually if we see a, um, I don't want to say positive, but a, a heroic uh, thing of the police, it is almost always with the police as a rogue cop going rogue against the evil system that they're a part of. Hmm. And there's a, there's a really interesting uh, yeah. dichotomy there um, that really I, I really want to see explored, um, not by me, <laughs> I'm not trying to write that type of stuff. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I saw a piece on that where somebody was saying, you know, so often we see someone like Will Smith or something and they're like, yes, the police are supposed to follow the rules except when they can't. And then they do these things because they have to make it happen. And um, exactly. Um, like that. One of the really interesting things, so is I am a massive true crime nerd and, uh, you know, the the way forensics is moving. Um, if anyone is familiar with the Golden State Killer case, uh, the use of, uh, of genetic uh, policing and forensic uh, tracing has led to the capture of one of the worst serial killers in California history. Um, and who just got sentenced to life without parole, which at his age is probably like seven weeks. Um, but- yeah, gave him like 26 this, lifetimes or something. <laughs> and so uh, looking at how the scientific police uh, policing uh, is going forward is going to be a really, really interesting way to go that I'm excited to see us look at. And, you know, I think I'm going to end up just doing interviews because writing right now is not going to be easy. 
but uh, yeah. I think I can probably get Paul Holes, who is the man most responsible for catching GSK for keeping the case going in Solano and Contra Costa County. So fingers crossed on that one. Uh, yeah, that I think what, what everybody's, uh, everybody's touched on this point of, of um, um, this is maybe not exactly the right terminology, but rogue cop. Um, where this one person sort of steps outside the boundaries of the law to solve the problem. And that's, that has been a, a recurring theme in media um, from, you know, Detective Noir all the way, you know, from the 30s and 40s all the way up to the present day. And um, I think it's, it's uh, the Punisher is a, a character that after maturation and, and modern incarnation has started to explore the possibility that all of that has started to influence the behavior of, of policing today, where uh, we see, we're, because of um, you know internet media and stuff, we're seeing a lot of uh, cops stepping outside the boundaries of the law um, and becoming judge, jury, and executioner, which is you know that's 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 the core of Judge Dredd. But um, I wonder how much, and I and um, I'm hoping to see some writing on this type of thing. How much do we think that this media has influenced generation after generation after generation and started to yeah. generate the idea that I am, I, you know, as, as a, a bearer of the badge or having the authority and the only one standing between, you know, order and chaos, you know, and I right. must protect people and I'm going to have to hurt who I have to hurt to do that or, or whatever. And this is just, incredible friction between the, the rule of law, which is what, the, you know, at least America was founded on and a number of other countries um, and people stepping outside of that who have authority. And we're, we're seeing a lot of churn over that type of thing now. And, and I, I also like to point out that, so Jerry Conway created the Punisher and recently there was a bit of a storyline where um, it, it, it uh, crosses with reality a little bit in that there's a number of law enforcement and military personnel who have adopted the, the Punisher crest, that skull crest. And um, he ends up getting cornered by some cops. And he's, he's always had kind of a complex relationship with the cops because the Punisher takes out the trash, right? Um, and they're telling him how much they appreciate him. And he sees that they're brandishing this, this sticker on the car and he just flat out threatens them. Like, if you if you become me, like, you're supposed to be better than me. And this has become one of the thematic, operational um, thematic mm -hmm. things in The Punisher is that he has a, an absolute 100% respect for, you know, like Captain America and the police. Like, he won't kill cops. He won't fight Captain America and stuff like that. And to, to flat out threaten uh, these police officers, like, if you cross that line, you become a criminal. And as a criminal, I will come and wipe you out, do this thing that you think is the right thing to do. Um, you know, it's, it's really weird and gray and messy. And again, I, I'd, I'd love to see writing on uh, along those lines as well, like looking at that yeah. influence, what it, what it might need if you grow up thinking like this. Yeah, I also think, um, so one thing with media and Hollywood. So we have now had how many generations of Hollywood films, blockbusters, small films, television shows, whatever it might be, where Hollywood has always largely, not 100%, but largely favored white actors in, in key roles. And so when you're looking at a, a cop film, whether it's science fiction or not, the, the good guy cops are usually white, even if they're kind of the bad boy rogue cop and the criminals are always um, either black, brown, or German or Russian for whatever reason. It's like, you know, or, or Asian. So, English, but even when they English aren't, people make good bad guys. Right, but, bad guys. So the, but even when they aren't, you still get this effect. Like if, I don't know if you've seen the, the recent series Black Lightning, but you have a, a protagonist who is supposedly very smart and generally, um, peace loving, right? Like he's the head of a school, he teaches everybody not to be violent. And then, but he also has superpowers. And so, you know, when he has to, he uses them. But one of the things he does use them for is that thing of, oh, well, I have to figure out this chain of who is in charge. So I'll go find the lowest guy that I can actually see on the street and I'll beat him up until he tells me the truth. And speaking to the science, like you were mentioning, Aaron, like we know 
that violent torture doesn't work. Like we even have this in science fiction as a trope. We go back to Star Wars, they torture Leia and she still doesn't give them the rebel base, right? Like we know it doesn't work. And yet, um, and yet in these other situations, that's what people turn to all too often, even if they are black, but you're right. It, it definitely representationally most are white. Yeah. And, and so you see for generations, this has been the pattern. And so now it's really at the, at that, that boiling point where Hollywood is now finally having to change and you're seeing a greater amount of diversity in the leading characters, but you're, you're not also seeing a greater number of diverse criminals. They're still mm -hmm. the same group of prescribed people by and large. Um, and I think that that's something that has to be addressed uh, in, at least in media. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true in, in fiction. It might I think be it is starting to be partly because people are really pushing now for the, the question, addressing the question of who's behind the camera, not right. just who are we putting on the scene, but who are our writers, who are our yeah. directors, and you know, who's making these casting decisions. Um, one of the movies that was just released that I think uh, really needs consideration for um, the Hugo Award is a movie called Project Power. Um, and um, I watched it, it's great. And it has, it has kind of, you know, it has a nice mix. Like it, it stars um, a young woman whose cousin, she's, she's black, her cousin is white. They both deal drugs um, for, um, for this distributor who is white, who's basically using people on the street as guinea pigs for the development of this drug. It's, it's very similar actually to the Black Lightning uh, base concept, but, um, but, the, um, but there you have, you know, the, besides the young protagonist, the, the, next, um, the next, you know, good guys are again, a mix. There's a, a cop who helps her out. And, the, um, and then there's um, a former military guy who was involved in the original experiment. And, um, and he's black. So um, we're starting to see it. And I think that involving more creatives and saying, you know, hey, let's bring these diverse stories up into the media and things like, um, like new, um, even new publishing uh, things. I mean, Netflix has been more open. The Obamas are doing their own shows. And then, um, oh, what's his name? He's, he's done so many movies, com mostly comedic. Um, he just opened, Jordan what? Jordan Peele? No. Um, he's a good one. Jamie <laughs> no, Jamie Foxx stars in Project Power, but there's a whole bunch of um, so-and-so presents uh, movies. Gosh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, um, he opened a huge multi-lot film studio in Atlanta. And um, what? Tyler Perry. Yes, Tyler Perry. So, you know, I mean, we might see a tremendous new wave of, of awesomeness that, that helps address. And I, and I think that that's exactly, we want to hear what people would like to see too. And also it's about imagining, you know, you read some science fiction or you, you see some TV and uh, you know, we also want to think about the future of policing in science fiction in the sense that how do we want it to be perceived or how should right. it be? And we know that this strange bias has come into things. Judge Dredd was started in 1977 by a bunch of very liberal, left-leaning, incredibly left-leaning guy in Pat Mills. Uh, you know, um, he would be very left in America. Uh, and he, he set it up as a sort of anti-establishment this is the thing to be frightened of. Right. This is what your your police state could turn into with judge, jury, and executioner. But the and then realize that lots, it and got lots kind of, of people, embraced. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, it sort of catches up. But and that's the thing, like this, and Judge Dredd is was originally drawn by a guy called Carlos Esquera, who unfortunately has passed away, but he's from Spain. And uh, the character was 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 potentially at the time some of his early drawings was going to be black. Uh, and it's like, you know, not many people would know that unless you actually had spoken to Carlos and these guys. 
And things changed and Carlos didn't even work on Judge Dredd to begin with. But the thing is, the world of Dredd has, you know, initially in the 80s, people liked Dredd being really strong and that reflects that era. And now uh, there's a whole different, uh, you know, there's different viewpoints on it. And uh, for instance, yeah. uh, I've got, got a book here called The Patriots, which is by Joseph Elliot Coleman, a London writer. And uh, this is set in 2047. So it's in between the time of now and the time of the Judge Dredd comics. It's about how the judges come to power and it's prophetic. Like the guy wrote it last year and it's unreal in, in, its, in what it's trying to say. And he's really captured his, obviously he's a London guy, um, but he's really captured his view extremely well. And I think that that's what we, we want to hear from people. But sometimes it's also hard to say, we're talking about the future of police and go write an essay. And not, that might not suit everyone. Right. What we then so do James, is we do it. We do a thing called instant fanzine. Right. So maybe somebody else can explain that, and I'll type some information in about it. I'll do that. Um, yeah. So instant fanzine is uh, instant fanzine just add content is the concept, and it's a James Bacon staple. Um, and it is you put out a series of questions, uh, and they can be very broad or very narrow, it depends. But it is designed so that people have something very easily to latch onto so that they can, maybe they don't have enough uh, thought on what they're gonna do for an article, but they do have uh, the ability to react to a simple question. And it's been incredibly productive. Uh, we just put out an issue now that has, uh, I think 40 people uh, who answered an instant fanzine setup that was really clean and quick. Um, and so it's a really nice way if you've never written before, but you like to post on Facebook. Um, it's, it's got that sort of ability to allow you to range from a very short, brief answer all the way up through essays. And some of those instant fanzine uh, responses have turned into full articles. So yeah, it's a great, great way to get a lot of really good content that I can lay out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we talk about, I'm, go ahead. Right. Oh, I was just going to say, I love the idea that, you know, Chris has mentioned that he's going to do a couple interviews. Um, James has mentioned, you know, doing some essays, um, some of the, the answering of the instant fanzine questions. And, you know, if there's another thing that you want to try, I don't know, a, new, a movie review, a, a science article, a, or something a whatever graphic. it might be. I mean, I mean it's, um, it can be yeah, too. To, to submit you know, whatever strikes your fancy that you think you could add some real content to the to the publication, send us a note. You know, we're not in a box. These ideas are not in a box. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Go ahead, Eric. I, I'd like to point out that the, um, uh, to continue to push this idea to, to be creative about what might be submitted. Um, for instance, one of the pieces that I got is an, is an analysis of something that's been around uh, that was created um, in the 80s, but it takes place in 2020. And uh, sort of the premise was, is, is, is this thing that I experienced 20 years ago, um, you know, am I remembering fondly just for nostalgia or is it something else? And rather than just rewatch it and write like an essay, um, he invited a good friend of his to watch it with him, someone who had never seen it before. So the article itself is essentially a transcript of their thoughts and their conversation. Um, so that was a very creative way of approaching this particular subject. Awesome. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage people to, to be creative. You know, they, uh, however you might want to present your ideas is, is probably acceptable. Like it's really important that we, we, we allow people access. And that includes sometimes with instant fanzine, me speaking to somebody on the phone and writing down their answers. Um, because, you know, we just need to be able to allow that access in, particularly where somebody's first language is not English, which we've had a number of our, our correspondents who are not from uh, um, Britain or America or Ireland or Australia or one of the countries where uh, English will be one of the main languages. Um, and, you know, it, so, you know, you're trying to help and facilitate there. Uh, we have had our, our articles translated as well. So, you know, it's about trying to create a way that people can access in and contribute to a fanzine. You don't need to contribute just to Journey Planet, of course. Like I would hope anybody who has a, an essay, you know, you could do a blog or you could put it into, uh, there's so many online uh, uh, resources now who, who will publish things. And, you know, there's no shortage of places you can publish, but we're out here touting for this issue for Journey Planet. And of course, even if you're unsure, you can email us at journeyplanet at gmail.com and say, 
I'm not really sure about this. Can somebody give me a call or, or something? And we will happily do that and try and, and lead you that direction. But we, we're trying to ask thoughtful questions. Um, right. You know, we're trying to sort of, and I'll give you a run through a couple of the quick questions. Like, which science fiction portrays the police or law enforcement in a way that captures your imagination? What fascinates you about the story of the characters? And then another example will be considering where we are today, how do you feel about police? How would you like to see policing change? And how might science fiction help to achieve that future? And of course, uh, in this issue, because it's such a sensitive subject for some people, and we're writing to people who live in a police state uh, or where censorship is a reality or where brutality uh, is more of a reality than we see, which is hard to imagine, I, I'm sure, but we're aware of it. There is a let we were are happy to afford some people, fans, of course, a level of anonymity because we don't want to get anybody into any trouble um, if they require anonymity to write about something that they see. But the last thing we want to do is to write to correspondents and say, tell us your name so that everyone can see it. That's not fair either. We need to hear the voices. Right. I think it's important we get the questions out. And um, yeah. and in terms of participation, you know, as we're showing with this NASVIC, there are a lot of resources now that can also help a, a widen participation. So like if you're out there and you're like, oh, well, this, there's, there's this amazing activist over in Portland and I've seen some of their videos and I'd love to interview them. Um, and you know, I could reach out to them through social media. I mean, of course, sure, set up an interview and you can, you can get on Zoom, you can record it and then you can transcribe it and um, you know these these tools are, or or you could even do it through Google Meetings, and um, you know their their um, closed captioning is actually pretty darn good. Really so um, so you could just you know do that to get your your base transcription, and then correct it where necessary. Right. And uh, similarly, if you need a a translator or you need an interpreter, the the ability for um, collaboration across the planet is just uh, massive. Yeah. Google, Google Translate. Sorry, folks, I gotta run. Oh, okay. I gotta run, but one last thing. Uh, yeah. Hope you all will uh, give us some wonderful content and uh, glad I could make at least a little of something. Um, but yeah, hope you all have a great time and it's been wonderful seeing you all. It's good to know that people are still out there. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, take care. You know, in, in terms of submissions, the um, I'm hoping that we do uh, just to expand on what James was saying, that I'm hoping and I'm encourage, I would encourage people um, in countries that don't normally uh, a lot of information come from to um, America or the other English speaking uh, countries. Uh, like for instance, um, maybe the policing where you are is good or you consider it good and you contrast that with uh, you know, a movie or television property or a comic that you found interesting. Like, so for instance, um, I, I remember seeing, uh, so in America, wearing a mask has become this really hot political football. Um, and there's been all kinds of conflict that's come from that. And here and there, the police have been involved in that. Um, I saw a clip in India um, where the cops carry the long sticks and uh, some some kids were breaking curfew. And if you're doing that, you should be doing it for like to, to buy food or deliver medicine. And if you're not, they're, they're whacking you with the stick. And then um, I saw some uh, some reports in Vietnam. I, I believe it was Vietnam where um, if the police catch you without your mask. Like if you're out without your mask, um, you know, they just give you one. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't that's a I revolutionary that. idea <laughs> here in America. Like if you see somebody without a mask and you're in a position of authority, you give them one. You don't arrest them, you don't find them, you don't have You don't them. beat them up. <laughs> yeah, we right. have so many so, places that say no entry without a mask. And I'm like, how come it isn't no entry without a mask? Masks masks are available right there. You right, know. they're right here. So, <laughs> and, and you know, I think that, that, that goes to a, a, a certain cultural understanding it. I'm not from India. I'm not from Vietnam. Uh, like I don't have that experience, but I would love to hear okay. from people who do, especially since, the, you know, a lot of these properties that we're talking about um, that, that, you know, these stories are out there are so hugely popular. They're, they're global, but our actual human experiences aren't exactly the same. And I, I would just, I would love to, to see that, that difference uh, positive or negative um, and, and any extrapolation thereof. 
Um, hey, one other thing that I just want to double check. So this is a live double check. Um, we, while we are soliciting original content, are we also able to take something that maybe someone published a year or two ago or something that's oh, yeah. been published in some other place? Yeah, as long as, like, it's, I think, don't think that's a problem, Eric. What do you think? I don't know. That's okay with me. We do have a question. Marguerite from Glasgow says hello to the panelists and asked, uh, the panel description talks about using SF to redesign and rebuild the police forces, but what about using it to build or normalize societies without a police? Or does everything just sort of revert to police by a different name? That's, uh, um, like I've heard, I've read about this um, in history. So pre-police, um, how societies uh, police themselves, how they were organized to prevent malfeasance or stealing or how they dealt with that. Um, to directly answer the question, I don't know, that's, that's a great topic to, 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 um, to explore. Um, I don't, I think we're, we're, you know, in America at least, I think we're a little too far down the rabbit hole to simply abolish police, even though that slogan does not mean abolish police. It means abolish police as it exists. And let's well, they've been saying defund different. the police is, I mean, some people say abolish, but defund really and has defund to defund as well, yeah. Um, not completely defunding, but saying, well, let's take funding that we're currently spending on this model right. and let's right. put it to the, uh, the various things that could also, you know, reduce crime and conflict and stuff. Right, um, right. right. That money should still be spent on on things that will help society at large, whether it's right. investigation of, of wrongdoings, like someone's been murdered, we need mm -hmm. to do the science to figure out what happened there, or whether it's um, money to be spent on helping mental health patients or people with other underlying conditions that might create problematic behavior, um, yeah. you know, yeah, but you're doing doing that. That. Do it in a thoughtful way. Do it in a way that helps people never have to get to the point where a crime is committed. You know, so there, and maybe right. there are points where it's not possible. Maybe we do need some kind of enforcement angle, but is it what we have now? I don't know. Right. Yeah, this, and the police uh, in reality tend to support that. They don't want to be social workers. They don't want to do mental health interdiction. They don't want to do any of those things, right? They're not qualified to do those things. They're not trained to do those things. Like a 16 week training right. is not going to do that. And it's interesting, um, the, the, the criminalization of mental health, we see that in movies. You know, we see that in television and, and comics and things like that, where someone's going crazy and they're going to be dangerous and they're freaking out and they're scaring people. And someone like a RoboCop comes along and just wipes them out. And it's like, right. yeah, maybe that's not the right, that's, that's how reality should work that way. And this, yeah, and I this, will say before we go to the sort of the concept of no police at all or societal, the societal management of people who are doing something that's wrong, like yeah. even just considering that the, the, how police, policing is right now, like Britain has 43 police forces, Our, the Republic of Ireland has one police force. And America has seventeen thousand. Um, you know this. This like it's just bonk. Like to me, it's just like how much money is being wasted on administration. That right. How many wheels are yeah. being reinvented? So, so before, yeah. and, and they, of course, they don't talk to each other. Yeah, but of course, we yeah. should. Right. Well, the focus isn't as 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 Eric has put eloquently across that you know we want to hear different voices. We need to recognize that the, the tragedy of George Floyd uh, and uh, ongoing matters in places like Portland, but all across the United States gets globally seen and has had a huge impact across countries. Um, and you know, the way that people are treated and the way that people want to be treated and the way that people expect to be treated. And there's some right. very, some massive inconsistencies there, which people are, 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 are coming, trying to come to terms with. But, uh, I, I, I think if there's, I think we would welcome essays or thoughts on a post-police society. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, you know. the thing is, policing is all about humanity and being humane, but somehow that's not what it's about at the same time. And, and science fiction is all about exploring humanity 
what it means to be humane. And I, I really can't think of a better tool to examine what's working, what's not working, what could work. Maybe, maybe we need a bunch of essays or, or answers about things that could work. And then somewhere in there, the, you know, the amalgam of smashing all those things together, there might be a gem of an idea that someone takes and runs with. And 10 years from now, we see some change that came out of this particular issue. Um, As a historian, I have to say, like, I feel like I have to say that um, although um, police being, policing being about being humane might be like how we like to think about it right Right. now, the history of policing is not about being humane. It's It's, not. It's about sustaining the safety and the power of the people who own things. And, um, and it's, you know, in America in particular, I was going to say, um, one of the things I, I have found fascinating about the abolish the police movement is its very distinct and, and increasingly acknowledged ties to the overall abolitionist movement. So I'm a docent and a historian at the William C. Goodridge Freedom Center and Underground Railroad Museum. So I've been studying a lot of early American history. And, um, and a lot of people are shocked to realize to what extent our model of policing as far as how it's organized, how people are recruited, all that sort of stuff, really uh, grew, you know, it wasn't designed, it just sort of grew out of um, the militias, the white militias that were organized to protect the slave owners in the situation where there were, there were tremendous, there were massively more slaves than slave owners, right? And there were a lot of people around white people who didn't own slaves, but often they didn't even own land. So according to the rules of the time, they weren't actually full citizens. You had to own land in order to be able to vote. You had to be white and own land in order to be elected as a representative. So so those were the people who were being protected by the police. And and those militias had um, absolutely full freedom to do any type of violence to people who were not in that category. So oh, Anne, that I'm actually right. brings, sorry. I was just gonna say that that is actually the story that you just told about the abolition, abolitionist movement. Something like that I could see being in this issue as well, acknowledging the history, because the way we would like to perceive policing and the way that policing actually is, they're two different things and people are having a really hard time, not people, but some people, are having a really hard time acknowledging that those two things are completely different. They're not one thing that, that while policing should be a certain way and it should protect humanity, that's not what it's doing um, in many cases. And it's true of the whole justice system, right? Like we have this image and again, coming from the media, we've watched how many police procedurals where somebody ends up in a court in front of a jury. 98% of American cases are determined through plea bargaining, 98%. So we've we've sort of incidentally and without even being aware of it, given a tremendous amount of power to the district attorneys who charge people with a lot of charges these days. We're not like people who haven't studied this don't realize how many charges you might face for a single crime and how much time you're threatened with Um, when they're trying to get a plea deal out of you. And then um, also how many, how disruptive it is and how many people are being involved in situations where they haven't been charged yet or they haven't been tried yet. And um, according to our constitution, we're all, we all deserve a a speedy trial. But if you look at, um, for instance, uh, Netflix, there's a documentary called Time That's about a teenager who was accused of stealing a backpack and was sent to one of the most vicious prisons in New York City. Um, And because he wouldn't plea, he was like, I didn't do it. Um, he, He held his ground and that meant he stayed in prison and he was beat up and he spent long periods in solitary. And I mean, it's, it was just a torturous existence. And the DA had no case. Their witness had, had gone to Mexico um, cause somebody had, you know, stolen something from him and he didn't feel safe anymore in the United States. So 
like it's and and or similarly if you watch the um the one about the central park five um they they see us i think it's something like that um you know you just realize that the the whole justice system is not how it has been represented it's not how we might hope that it is um and if we don't really look at it closely um through something like uh, the new jim pro which is a really good book or other scholarship that's been being done and 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 a lot of people do do prison mission work you know there are people on the ground who know what this is what is happening um but um the rest of people don't seem to really when they see us yes that's uh and, and i think and i think we definitely welcome articles along those lines although as eric has said also hoping for other countries where the situation can be very very different and hopefully yeah. we will get some articles from different countries but we've only a few minutes left so just going back to what you actually started on, I should actually brought us back in a way to, I was going to say Tulsa, which obviously Eric is a, and for those of you who haven't seen Watchmen, the HBO series, uh, which obviously causes me a dreadful conflict because Alan Moore created this comic book and now he, he you know, they, they basically ensured that he didn't own his creation. Um, but now, they, now uh, 33 years later, we've got this amazing TV series um, and uh, without spoiling the, 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 the actual TV series, there's a lot about Tulsa in it to begin with, Eric, isn't there? There is. I mean, it, it starts off with exactly that. Um, and it, this is unfortunately a subject where I would <laughs> get right off track and into history with um, any, anybody who might think that Tulsa is like an isolated incident is, you know, sadly mistaken. There, there's um, at least one book that I'm aware of called uh, Beneath the Bitter Waters that is about um, these what are essentially um, ethnic cleansing episodes in America the, before the phrase was even created by the UN in, in, a, in the 20th century. Of the Chinese um, as well and then Native American. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, there, there were Chinese people, uh, towns completely raised, there, uh, the people chased, you know, entire black populations rounded up and chased out of town um, and all their possessions burned in a single night. Um, but to move on to, to back to the subject at hand, I saw there was a, 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 a comment about world building around justice systems with uh, and the comment specifically about uh, the prosecution of property, um, um, destruction of theft of property versus the prosecution of uh, people uh, who have crimes against each other. And, you know, again, that's a great subject. I would uh, I would love to see articles submitted that are about um, worlds that are built on extreme or, or interesting or weird justice systems. Like that is also something that can be explored in this issue. Um, I, I, really, there is so much content out there and, and no one of us is going to know what all of it is. And, you know, I am sure there's, there's someone out there that, that's going to be aware of some really interesting, obscure property like is one that I can't remember the name of it right now, but it, it came before, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, they made a movie out of it with James Caan and um, where the aliens come and he has a, he has a side, he, he has partners is one of the aliens. Oh, right. Alien yeah. Nation. Alien Nation, they made a TV Yeah, yeah, I love that. I yeah. love that, I love the TV series. Yeah, but there's another book. There's another oh, series. Of books. Life? Oh, sorry. <laughs> there's another series of books that, that has a sort of a similar premise with a very different kind of aliens and very different kind of outcomes. And you know, I, I'm hoping that people drag this stuff up. You know, they, they dress this stuff up and, and present it to us as well. Okay. It's another police procedural with human cop, alien cop, but it's a completely different take on it. Yep. I can't remember the name of it. That's okay. <laughs> well, I think we're nearly done. So um, just as I think hopefully you all have heard, uh, the last bit is you might have something else you want to write about. But we've also got some questions about the Watchmen TV series. So if you just wanted to watch that TV series and then actually answer some questions of, and, and share your opinion, that would be really good as well. But I expect that we're going to get cut off shortly. So uh, I'm not too sure if we have anything else to say. Eric or Aaron, would you like to finish up? Oh, good. I, there's so much. There's so much yeah. content around this. You know, yeah, it's I'm huge. And I'm, I, I should rate. give the date. 15th of September is our deadline, but please email us at journey. Is it now 15th? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, it's 15th. Oh, 
says 15. <laughs> It is 15. Okay. Well, no, no, no. Either way. Either way. <laughs> just keep sending it. Just send something in. <laughs> Are you guys going to be able to join um, attending the Discord? Yeah, absolutely. I'm ha happy to answer questions. And obviously, journeyplanet at gmail.com. Drop us an email uh, and just say, and we'll be, we'll be positive and love to hear from you. So yep. that's all we can say, really. And we're PDF, Thank so it's you. not like we have our last fanzine was 194 pages. So there's no, there's no, there's no, there's right. no issue. So. Yeah, the and, one thing about that as, and, as an author is I was like, okay, I put so much effort into this, and is anybody actually going to read the whole thing? Yes, uh, we, we the last fanzine that we did, which was about a, a seven weeks ago, had a few thousand reads in the first while, and now it's down to about 20 reads a day. We've had fanzines with Journey Planet. Chris will give you the figures. Some of them are quite high into five digits and um, it depends what the subject is so yeah lots of people read the fanzine strangely it surprises me and it's really nice that people enjoy it's not strange it. they're awesome uh, but uh yeah and but you know yeah that's, so that's so that's really cool james but, they're gonna cut right. you off yeah thank uh, you very much thank you guys we'll see you in the discord bye 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 bye